So hello again. Uh, tonight we're going to talk about, uh, I guess you could think a little uh, analysis and uh, indistinguishable from extraterrestrial. Well, you'll, you'll figure that out as, you, as we go along with the presentation. So this will be a thought experiment. Um, we're going to take what's claimed by multiple aspects and then see if there's a basis once we start looking at a bigger picture of things. And there will be analogy used as a foundation for why this can lead to that. And uh, I'm okay if, you know, some people get it, some people don't, but just don't suppress other people's uh, ability to like, hmm, maybe there's a point there. Buckle in, hang on to your seats, enjoy the ride. So first I'll speak paradoxically versus hypothetically. Um, some people may have heard of the Fermi paradox, if there are so many potentially habitable exoplanets in our galaxy, and there are billions of galaxies, then where are all the extraterrestrials? Maybe there is nobody else out there but us. Okay, first thing you have to realize is the Fermi paradox originated in 1950. Exoplanets were just a postulation, nothing proven. The first exoplanets were discovered in 1992. Back in Fermi's day, he didn't even know um, that there were a lot of stars in our galaxy that we know are now there. Back in his time frame, there was hundreds of thousands of stars in our galaxy, and then there was millions, and then hundreds of millions. Now we're in the hundreds of billions just in our galaxy. So the odds on there being exoplanets around most of them what we found out so far in our observations is pretty much every star has got some planetary junk orbiting it. Um, we found more than 5,000 exoplanets so far, and we're finding out that the number of K-type or orange stars, like a little more stable than a red dwarf and much longer lived than our yellow type of sun, we're going to be finding more and more exoplanets and the more we look the better our technology the more we can find out that um, there are a lot of them out there there are a lot of them that are earth potentials as in they're about the same size maybe a little larger than the earth but they're in the goldilocks zone they're at the right temperature to have liquid water and some of them are too close to their star because orange dwarf stars are smaller and not quite as hot as um, other stars so they can orbit closer and still be in the Goldilocks zone. But if a star can last a billion plus years longer than our sun, then if there are planets around that star and they're habitable, they've been around a billion plus years longer than Earth. Plenty of time for them to understand physics we have yet to encounter. Plenty of time for them to develop far more advanced and likely superior technology. For us to presume that because we can't do something, that means it can't be done by any other civilization on any other exoplanet in the galaxy or even in the universe is presumptive arrogance. But maybe they're out there. Maybe they have technology superior to ours. Don't want to share it with us. Don't want to interact with us for their own safety. You know, much like we know now, we don't want to contaminate their natural progression by exposing them to us. So we do that on the planet. We won't want to go look at some tribe in the middle of, of the Brazilian jungle that has never been exposed to humans that are civilized. We don't walk in and go, hi, how you going? Because we might give them diseases, will affect their natural progression. We send drones overhead. And if we send drones overhead to them, what's a drone? But that's called the zoo hypothesis. Keep your distance. Don't contaminate the natives. So we've discussed before the concept of you describe what you experience based upon what you know. If you happen to be one of those natives and you see a drone that happens to be a jet drone fly overhead your village, how would you describe that? Well, you, the only thing you know that flies in the sky are birds and uh, flying fish above the river. That's all they know. So they'll create things that they describe as a flying fish that uh, has a tail rudder. Actual flying fish don't have tail rudders. So they describe it based upon what they know. 
So there was a guy named Arthur C. Clarke who one time uh, talked about uh, technology being so advanced that we may not be able to uh, sociologically keep up with it. And there may be technology out in the universe at other civilizations that we cannot explain. So I took that back and said, it would be hypocritical for us to say, the earlier civilizations on this planet, look how dumb they were describing aircraft as flying fish with tail rudders. What do we know today that we would describe something that is far more advanced? And yeah, we, we can fall into that same trap. We're currently presumed to be the pinnacle of science and technology in this universe. Yeah, sure. When I know that there's things that have been out there for billions of years longer than us. If you think that, then you might just have an underappreciation for the scale of the galaxy, the scale of the universe, and how old things are. So I said, well, what are things that average people in our advanced intelligent life on this planet might have difficulty understanding or explaining? People are driving around in automobiles with electronic fuel injection. You don't know how that works. Uh, yeah, it involves a computer. That doesn't explain how it works. That just says it's got a computer. All you know is you push your foot down on the pedal and it goes vroom vroom. Yeah, most people do not understand how electronic fuel injection works. Or if they understand that, they don't know why, why vehicles don't have starters anymore. Because electronic fuel injection, they found out, if you know where the cylinders are in the cylinder uh, compression cycle, you can without any further compression, ignite the spark plug and push that cylinder down. And then if you know where the other cylinder is coming up, you can hit that one with a spark and you can start the engine running without a starter. And they actually do that. And where they do that is you pull up to a traffic light and all of a sudden your internal combustion engine stops. And then you step on the gas and within a second, the engine starts up again and you go on down the road. You couldn't do that if you use the distributor because you wouldn't know where the cylinders are in the compression cycle. So they can only do that based upon electronic fuel injection. But how many average people on the planet comprehend that stuff? Well, I do because I enjoy digging through rabbit holes. But what if you said, hey, you got a phone there. It's got a uh, mapping software on it. You can tell where you're at. You can go find where the nearest gas station is. How does all that stuff work? And if you said, yeah, GPS and a computer. That says some of the parts it's got. It doesn't explain how it works. Here's one that you might have experienced that you didn't know that was really what that is. Snack foods. If you open up a bag of snack foods and you see that the inside of the bag is like mirrored, it's shiny. And you think, oh, that's just, just mylar. It's like, you know, metal uh, or, you know, it's, it's uh, the really shiny stone thin layer stuff that they, you know, shined up inside. Like, no. Actually, what it is, it's plastic. They found, and 3M makes these things called uh, ESR films. There is no glass. There is no mirror. There is no sputtered metal coatings. It's actually just multiple layers of very, very thin, moderately transparent plastic. Not quite clear. And they found that by putting a stack of about eight of these layers that are microscopic in nature together, the light goes in, hits the top layer, and most of the light gets uh, uh, go. It goes into the layer, but there's some percentage of the light will, will reflect off the layer. And by staggering the layers and causing each layer to have a different index of refraction, the Snell's law, they found that they could just bend more and more frequencies up, and so now you have these silvery looking, very thin, pliable films that reflect 98% of the light that comes towards them. But how many people knew that things like ESR films exist? They just look at their snack food and go, oh, look, shiny wrapper. I like rabbit holes, so I found out there's got to be metal involved. There's got to be glass. It's like interwoven reflective. Thing. No, no. It's just clear material that they dope with certain coatings to make it slightly different index of refraction, and they stack them under compression, microscopically thick eight layers. And it's just, it's thinner than paper. How many people understand that stuff?
So we're currently on the fourth. Help, uh, is there any benefit for the snack you're eating? Yes. Yes. Because if the snack gets exposed to heat, the reflective material will disperse the heat. So the snack foods have a longer shelf life. So we're currently on the forefront of understanding new things at the quantum physics level. And we're fabricating things known as nanoscale metamaterials, like these 3M ESR films. And most you know, the general population doesn't understand this level of physics and the fabrication and such. They, they would just think of it as it's mysterious. I don't know how they do it. It's just mysterious. But I like it. It works. It keeps my snack foods fresher and it's shiny and it makes those uh, blankets that they use for emergency services really cheap. Or you could just, it's indistinguishable from magic. So we'll just go, I don't know what it is. It must be magic. No, it's not magic. It's just science and technology that most people do not understand. And that's okay. All things that we can create can be mastered if you spend the time to learn about them. And it doesn't mean that, you know, you got to go back to college and learn it. It's self-taught. You can just research some things. And there are a lot of sites that will give you science without the gobbledygook, so to speak, and will explain how superconductors work and such. Um, but that's just the stuff that we know about that, you know, like our snack food comes in. What about the stuff that's still out there being created? That stuff is, yeah, that's new and different. And um, you can't go buy it on Amazon. They're further down the road. They may have black budgets for these things. So even if you wanted to learn about it, it's not yet ready for your great unwashed masses public hearing to know about it. It doesn't mean it's implausible or impossible or that it's not yet practical. It just means it's not out in the general public, so to speak. But there are things like superconductivity. It's used in MRI machines. It's used in bullet trains. It's used in particle accelerators. You're not going to have it in your home anytime soon. Oh, I'm going to have a quantum computer. Not in your lifetime, probably. There are metamaterials. Um, you can take helium gas, throw an electric charge to it to create an ion beam of helium subatomic particles, and then you can direct those through a magnetic field and actually at the like billionths of a meter level, carve into materials so you can etch them. Uh, this is how we make the microelectromechanical chips that are in your mobile phones. It says, I tilted it this way. I tilted it that way. North is that way. All that stuff is based upon MEMS chips, and those are generated using helium ion beam etching. Then there's coatings. You can take a metal in a vacuum chamber, ionize it to produce a gas, and then throw a charge through a material and cause the ionized metal to coat billions of a nano, billions of a meter thickness coatings on them. So when you go by your uh, diagonal mirror and you want that maximum reflectivity of your diagonal mirror for your telescope, you're going to be using technology that's called ion beam deposition. Who knew? It's just a dielectric mirror coating. And when you buy that, uh, next generation computer chip based laptop that's got like 12 cores and it's you know five gigahertz and things like that in order to carve out the transistors for that small a space they use um, near nanometer scale um, etching and to do that they use extreme ultraviolet lithography but that stuff only works in a vacuum because any particles of anything are going to scatter the beam. So they've got to put it in a vacuum and the ultraviolet is so strong and well down into the UV range that you can't look at it. It will blind you. You don't want it on your skin. It will burn you. So they have to put it inside giant chambers coated with big thick plates to make sure none of it gets out. But that stuff exists. It's used by four different companies around the planet to make these extreme UV lithography top in very dense chips. But you know, you can go to the store and buy one or you can order one. And there's a difference between somebody being unaware or not knowing about something and it being impossible. Simply because you don't know exist it exists, 
doesn't mean it's impossible for it exi to exist. It just means it's not in your awareness. You'd have to go looking for it. So I just mentioned the, the MEMS chips. This is actually an electron uh, beam microscopic image of gears and their motorized gears. And when they turn, they turn because the little slider on the right goes up and down. Uh, sorry, back and forth in this. It works like a clockwork, but it's turning gears that are maybe 20 billionths of a meter across. There are other things that, uh, you know, didn't exist when you went to school, and now you have to learn about them, things like quarks and top quarks and Higgs bosons. And so there's there's things out there that you can learn later in life. Now, Monroe, yeah. when you're looking at all this information and you think about, well, I think about that, you know, 50 years ago, people were doing things in their garage, you know, but yeah. today... Our, our scientists, our young people, where are they able to, they can't go in their garage and create all these things because they re require such massive machinery yeah. and stuff. So yes. are they are there places that they can go to um, try yes, to? There, yes, there, yes, there are U.S. government grants that you can get to make use of these big machines elsewhere. Um, I was investigating one from Lawrence Berkeley Labs out in California to be able to use their helium ion beam etching system to make parts for photonic propulsion thrusters. And uh, yeah, if you know where to look, if you know how to ask, yeah, you'll never be able to afford one of these machines and it probably wouldn't fit in your house. But think back to early mainframe business computers. Uh, yeah, I wanna write some computer software. I just need an IBM 360 to fit inside my house, be able to afford the lease costs and pay for the power for it. It was impossible for the do-it-yourselfer to have access to mainframe scale computing. Nowadays, your mobile phone has far more capability at a far lower price and fits in the palm of your hand. So as the technology progresses, yeah, it gets more accessible. You know, I've I've got six Raspberry Pi computers in my house doing a variety of things. And whenever I wanted to do something else, eh, 15 bucks, I'll go buy another computer. Software is downloadable for free. So if you are interested, if you're willing to go down the rabbit hole, you can find these things. And what you find out is that the people in mainstream communications of science, like Neil deGrasse Tyson and Michio Kaku, the more I watch their videos, the more I know they're not keeping up. They're saying things that might have been true back then or might not have existed back then. But yeah, they're, they exist now. They're proven in fact. And you guys ought to get up to speed. So don't look for your um, social media hero spokesperson to stay on top of all this stuff if they don't stay on top of all this stuff. So in the future, I think we'll be looking at energy sources, and I'm not saying batteries, because batteries have to be charged up. I'm saying we might want to look at energy sources that are power generating that don't use fuel. The Casimir effect in a vacuum will generate a small amount of electricity, but it's a very small junction, and you create one under vacuum. But if you leave it at that, it'll never be useful. But if you scale it up to the size of a AAA battery, um, you now have something you can replace a AAA battery with that never runs out of power, never, ever. And if you think that's indistinguishable from magic, then you need to study it because there's actually a US patent on Casimir quantum power generation because People are working on this stuff. Radiation reflection pressure for propulsion. LIGO, the uh, gravity wave detector, um, had to actually deal with this. They turned on a high-powered laser, and it made their mirror move. Nothing burning, no fuels. They turned it on. All it was powered by was electricity, and the mirror moved back and forth just slightly at the nanometer level. But since LIGO is so super sensitive, they detected gravity waves as soon as they turned it on. How to deal with it? Well, there's actually a Nobel Prize for something called 
photonic tweezers when you're working under an electron microscope with viruses or bacteria and you want to move the individual cells around so you can get a better view or you want to turn them over so you can see the other side of the virus. Um, they use very, very low power laser beams to do that. And they just pop the individual cells with a very small amount of laser power and the light reflecting off the surface of the virus or bacteria pushes it. Very low force, but it's a place to start. But these things do exist. The one thing that doesn't exist, so I'll throw it out there as postulation, is spatial transportation. We're finding out that because of the Pauli exclusion principle, it says two different subatomic particles can't be in the same place at the same energy level at the same time. One is going to push out the other. So that means that two particles can't be in the same place at the same time. That means that every particle that exists has location. It has information of locality. And the moment you have location, you can start to coordinate what is where, just like you can with GPS. We're not talking about where your car is or where you are. We're talking about where subatomic particles are. And the moment that you can translate that from one coordinate to another coordinate, you can now take a particle and move it from here to there. Once you can do that, you'll have the ability to start growing that outward and say, well, if we give particles different address, the particle will be in a different location, and therefore we move the particle in space without silly, you know, science fiction stuff. So what we think of as unfathomable, unfathomable, um, is no excuse for it to not exist. We think of high energy things as uh, we'll never be able to do this because it's just too big and too difficult and cost too much money and Remember, fusion, any day now, just keep giving us money, um, but we have to have something that's bigger and bigger and costs more and uses more energy. And if you put more energy in, eventually you'll get some out, but it's not producing effective energy out. Well, maybe if you want to produce energy, start with a AAA battery and you just scale it up. Kind of like the first Tesla Roadster. They took a lithium ion battery that would go in a laser pointer and they just said, what if we had 5,000 of these batteries? Could we power a car? Yeah, a pretty fast car. So um, start with small and then scale it up. So what if we wanted to go interstellar distances, visit planets or moons faster? We want to go from uh, uh, years or lifetimes down to months or faster. Well, we have these things called Abi, uh, Abi Curie, um warp drives that we think are going to be the solution because we need to go faster than light. That's like bumping your head up against a brick wall. Well, if we put enough energy into it, we'll smash our head through the brick wall. Maybe, maybe you can take a different approach and you don't need to do that. Or we'll have wormholes. The wormholes will cross light years in seconds. Maybe, maybe you don't actually need to do that. Maybe just spatial travel. If you can change the coordinates of a material from one location to another, you're there almost instantaneously. No big machines are needed. No warp drives, no wormholes no uh dune style folding of space time you know if you can do it simply who's gonna spend billions of dollars to make it happen because you know part of the fun of creating these advanced machines is the billions of dollars for the prototype but if you can do it for less than billions of dollars it, there's not much interest in doing that so let's take that out to the next notch so we're discovering increasingly Earth-like exoplanets that are orbiting longer around orange stars and not just uh, nearby in our galaxy. Think about if we're finding more of them than we can find them in other galaxies beyond ours, which means if they're roughly the size of the Earth, that means the gravity is about the same. If they are in the uh, Goldilocks zone, that means that they're uh, nitrogen, oxygen uh, levels of gas mixture could be roughly the same as Earth. The air pressure would be about the same. Um, so similar to Earth. They may be orbiting closer to their star, 
because their star is putting out less energy. But if it's an orange star, it's going to be stable. If it's a red dwarf, flares are going to be very unstable. So orange. Orange stars last about a billion years longer than yellow stars like ours. If they're in roughly the same gravity, if they're in roughly the same gas composition, roughly the same pressure, odds are if biology, as far as we know it, works elsewhere in the universe because there's nothing special about what's going on here, why would they need to look alien? Everybody thinks extra extraterrestrials have to look alien. What if they didn't look alien because they came from a place very similar to here? So they're not grays, they're not greens, they're not blues, they're not orange, and they're not purple. They're not uh, giants or, you know, small dwarf size. They're kind of normal size. Some, I mean, people on Earth have a range between you know, not quite five feet to close to seven feet. But the average is, is somewhere five uh, to six feet. And because their temperature ranges and their star exposure is pretty much the same as ours, you don't think about them being lizard people or insects or fish or tree people or you know so-called they're ice warriors they look quite similar to us they're not going to have an odd number of limbs or digits and they're going to have opposable thumbs because that's convenient that's useful they're not going to have two heads or three arms or four legs or you know be weird or or they're probably just going to have one heart and not a four lobe brain like a, 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 a ferengi would so they're going to look like us now, if they are slightly different from us, let's say their skin tone is uh, a little whiter or a, a little uh, darker or maybe has a different shade, then you can probably deal with that uh, with, uh, you know, contact lenses, makeup, wigs, clothing. Once they do that, they'll be pretty much like us in appearance. Think about it this way. Um, there are a lot of people that are in the U.S., that if you go back through their lineage, they weren't born here. They aren't Native Americans. They came from Europe. Well, they've been here for a while. Posit that as, let's say they were from elsewhere. They've been here for a long time. They may have uh, bred with humans. And so now they're indistinguishable from humans. And maybe their junk DNA is dissimilar from our junk DNA. And so, you know, one person's junk DNA is another person's uh, alien legacy. But if they've been here long enough, then they're going to be able to read, write, speak our languages, maybe as well as their own. And in fact, if you look at how generations of people that came from other places on this planet have acclimated themselves to where they live now through generations, they no longer speak the old tongue from where they came from. They speak American English, because that's where they've been, or regional, you know, Southern or Bostonian or New York or New Jersey or wherever, they might still be aware of the greater universe. They might still understand some of the technology from where they came from, but their social customs and social involvement skills will be pretty contemporary. So if, if that happened to be the case, how could you tell them apart from anybody else? Maybe they'll have atypical social behaviors, different marital status, different number of progeny, children, maybe where they prefer to hang out, maybe what they find interesting. Maybe they'll have worked in advanced technology businesses or helped to start up companies. How many places on the planet have they been to for recreation and for business? Have they ever worked with other governments on, you know, things that might be government secret projects? Do they know about things at a level of detail that people generally don't know about in their everyday lives? Do they come up with seemingly implausible prognostications or postulations that some people might go, I must be magic. So that's how you'd spot them. Maybe they're not from elsewhere. Maybe they've just been here a very long time. You know, we're now, we're now finding that um, there are places on this planet that have had civilization more than 10,000 years ago, 12,000 years ago. Every time they dig deeper and they find new settlements, it's another few hundred to a thousand years. So if we know that things like us, you know, normal looking humans have been around that long, 
Maybe they've lost a lot. Maybe they were once a far more civilized, advanced people than there are today. Think of it this way. If your lineage came from Europe, can you still speak the regional language and the local dialect from where your lineage came from? Probably not. Think about the technologies that got you here. If many generations ago, your precursors came over here in sailing ships, I guess that must mean you know how to sail because they did, right? No, you had no need for that technology, so you lost it. Now you can regain it back again because it's something that exists in the broader environment of this planet. But if it's even more advanced technology, probably not and maybe not for a while. What about your writing and your language? If you've been here a long time and your language wound up on the dead languages list, think about it. You can actually look up on an ongoing basis. We're losing what they refer to as native tribal languages because they don't get used anymore. And the reason why they don't get used anymore is uh, essentially coercion. If you look at all the languages that are on the planet and how many people speak each one of them, it's kind of weird that the things that are most popular are not dominated by the language spoken by the most people. If you want to talk about technology, you got to learn English. If you want to do air traffic control, uh, even if it's pidgin English, if you're an airline pilot, you need to speak English because those are the com that's the common language of those aspects of society. But sometimes it's forced on you. Um, you know, the people that will say, if you come to this country, you must learn to speak English. Okay, you, you can't do that instantaneously, and you're not going to learn English before you come to this country. Um, you're going to be an immigrant. But once you get here, there's a general expectation you're going to speak English. And after you do that for a couple of generations, you might lose your original language. But then again, you can be even harsher. People from one country can go to another country, conquer them, and either you're going to adopt our religion and you're going to speak Latin, or if you don't learn English, then you won't be around much longer. That's that's just how behaviors tend to make written and spoken languages disappear over time. So what it gets down to is if they've been around for a long time, they've melded into our society. And as the saying goes, they be us, we be them. Uh, so long ago that even they may no longer realize it. So as I was saying, we now know of civilized environments that are more than 12,000 years uh, back. Maybe they just lost their cities and their infrastructure due to natural disasters like tectonic plate shifts or volcanoes or floods or asteroid impacts or comet impacts or you know some pulsar from space got us. The list is long. But maybe some of them kept their technological advancements. Maybe it saved some of them, but couldn't save all of them. So there's just a small quantity left. They look like us, talk like us. They'd be able to settle in on this planet, interact with us on a daily basis. But they may have some inkling of technology that's 10,000 plus years ahead of where we are today. But if that's the case, where would you find them? Well, you're not going to find them where they were, where the disaster happened. So coastal areas, no, because flooding can happen there. Even open plain areas, if you look at the um, um, younger driest flooding of the northwestern United States, that was once an open plain until the floodwaters came in out of Canada. So no floodable valleys, not near tectonic plate edges where earthquakes can happen or volcanoes, not low-lying islands out in the Pacific because they can be flooded. Maybe they're just hang hiding out in plain sight in underground areas of major cities, but more likely they'll be in secure places where they can keep their communities like deep under the oceans, the interior of the Antarctic, or high desert plateaus beneath the surface. People look at places like uh, Machu Picchu or Pumapunku, and they only look at the stuff that's on the surface. Has anybody done any uh, x-ray or muon scattering graphs of what's beneath those sites down to, you know, maybe 150 feet. Is there anything down there? Because as we look in Egypt, we find new tombs that we didn't uh, have awareness of before because they're buried. 
But maybe they've got their own space on this planet and they come out and occasionally do surveillance runs to check on the current human progress regarding nuclear weapons, atomic power, military capabilities. Maybe those are the guys that are flying the Tic Tacs. It doesn't require extraterrestrials, just requires a smarter than the average bunch doing it. Okay, so people can get irritated by me dragging these things out and going, well, if you've got proof, just spit it out. Is it extraterrestrials or is it long-lived civilizations on this planet? In my book, either one works. So most people like to fall back on that Carl Sagan chestnut of extraordinary claims require extraordinary proof. Think of all the things that have come into existence since Carl existed. What would be the extraordinary proof for shiny, reflective stuff inside your snack food bag? How would you explain that? Well, it's mylar, it's metal. It's like, no, it's just plastic. So what's the extraordinary proof for that? If something exists, does it need extraordinary proof? Well, now that the U.S. House of Representatives have people testifying saying uh, the UAP, UFO, Tic Tacs do exist. They physically exist. They've been visually tracked. They've been tracked on radar. What more proof do you need than their physical existence? Well, we don't know how it's working. Great. You got a smartwatch? You wear a smartwatch? Can you explain how the internal workings of that smartwatch work? Possibly not. So it exists. It's reality, but you can't explain it. So what's the proof that it exists? Well, it's because I'm wearing one. So let's go back to that guy, the other guy, Occam's supposed razor. Um, a smartwatch is proven simply because it does exist. That advanced technology of which you were unaware is possible. It exists. It's proven. It's cheap enough that you can produce it in high volume consumer products like, I don't know, um, polyester foil for snack food bags. And uh, most people are oblivious to how it works or how it was fabricated. But that's just how things work on this planet. If it's useful for us, we don't really care to understand how it works. So in conclusion, not everybody is expected to know everything about everything. And with the increasing amount of stuff coming into existence, meaning not yet known by nearly everyone, that increases every day. What we initially think we need to do something may not actually be what's required. Think of the first microwave oven. How big was it? How much did it cost? How little power did it have? Think of the first photocopier. We don't really use photocopiers anymore. We have uh, inkjet and laser printers. We scan it and then print it. What about a smartwatch? If you were looking at an IBM 360 mainframe computer and you said, someday I'm going to wear that on my wrist and it's going to know where I'm at and know how to do GPS and what's GPS. Um, how many people could connect those dots that that big thing that occupied a warehouse sized room, all the power, all the air conditioning, the raised floors for all the big fat cables. And now far more capable technology exists on your wrist and costs better part of a thousand dollars if you buy one full price. Because we currently cannot do something does not mean it's impossible throughout the universe or even in our galaxy, or that it's even difficult to accomplish. Once you know the physics, once you can deploy it, it may actually be a piece of cake, but we won't know until we try. Or as that pillar at Union Station in Los Angeles, California says, around the top of the pillar, you can see it there, vision to see, faith to believe, and courage to do. You never know what you can accomplish until you try. And as usual, lots of links. Lots and lots of links. Okay. Comments? Questions? Yeah, a couple. Um, they do put a film inside of uh, aluminum soda cans, too, so the soda won't rot <laughs> their aluminum, and so they plastic coat those. Yeah, so what, what chemical is it in soft drinks that would cause the aluminum to oxidize? Oh, I don't know. That's a good Phos question. Phosphoric acid. Ah. Yeah. Phosphoric acid. Well, so that yeah. it's not just uh, um, 
uh, snack bags. Uh, also, uh, is there a possibility that any of this like new tech um, that's coming out is really alien technology kind of hmm. hidden out? You mean, did Tang come from the extraterrestrials? <laughs> Not just Tang, all kinds of things. No, I, I was pulling for the lowest common denominator straw. Yeah, I, I see. Yeah, but things like the latest generation of uh, photovoltaic cells that generate approaching 50% power. How did we get that? Well, it turns out it's nothing more than quantum physics. They found that as long as you have the material and you create it in layers and you yeah. adjust the chemistry per layer, each layer will have the photons that it can convert to electricity absorbed and produce electricity and then if you join all those layers together with each one getting a different slice of wavelengths, you can generate more electricity out. But is that extraterrestrial? Is that you know advanced technology on this planet more so than we are? No, that's just you know connecting the dots and where you get from here to there. I think a lot of the technology that we just see coming into existence in our everyday lives is merely that. Yeah. As we delve deeper into quantum aspects of things, and when we get down to the point where you can do quantum scale fabrication, things get to be really weird because you can do things that you can't do at a higher level. I, I guess what, I, what I'm looking at is, is there, uh, you know, there's a normal progression to discovery and inventing things, but were there something that were gaps or leaps uh, that were kind of un unexplained except the uh, say insight from the inventor none that i'm aware of because you know i i looked at the bbc program connections and yeah, when like somebody that. comes out with something new i can uh -huh. dig down through the rabbit hole and find out where did that come from and it turns out the person was just thinking about something else that they were aware of and then said well what if i did with this with that and mix the two together and like okay and then we got into the quantum realm and we started talking about photonic computers and that just like opened up an entire realm of things. Yeah. And when, um, for those people that are familiar with Moore's law, this is where the number of transistors you can fit on a certain square area of chip when you're making integrated circuits has just gone exponential and it just keeps going exponential. And when's it gonna run out of steam? And every few years, Somebody who doesn't have an awareness of quantum physics will say, oh, we're going to run out. Uh, Moore's law is going to bump its head against the ceiling any day now. Uh -huh. we, create, we create newer technology, and we look at things slightly differently. And, uh, yeah, another whole new avenue of escalation of the exponential curve opens up. The latest one is um, ribbon finfets. Now, um, ribbon finfets. When they first laid out transistors on integrated circuits, they were flat. And something that's flat has a certain domain size. It's, it takes up space. Uh -huh. What if you turned it 90 degrees? Look how many more you can pack in. And when you do that across, you know, 100 million transistors on something uh, about half the size of a playing card, you're now into the billions of transistors on your computer chip and you think nothing of it. What if you put them up on edge and then on the thing that's standing on its edge, you put like little little um, condominiums at different levels of that thing standing on the edge and you made those 90 degrees as well. So now in the space of what used to be one transistor, you can get 32 of them. That's just like, if you look at what they're doing, the, the chip die size is getting bigger and bigger, and they're putting multiple different types of processors on the same substrate, on the same die. So they now have, you know, NVIDIA has a uh, computer with graphics processor that's got 30 billion transistors in it. Where's the limit? Well, 
the limit is actually quantum. Once you get down below, I think it's seven nanometers of features in your integrated circuits, yeah. those damn electrons don't want to sit on the other side of the junction. They actually yeah. want to do quantum tunneling, and you'll have an electron saying, I see your junction. I see the gate that's holding me back, but I can care less. And the electron literally just tunnels through the transistor junction and comes out on the other side. So it becomes leaky. It, it conducts when it shouldn't be conducting. And so that's why they're looking at what if we just switch photons around? They're not going to be leaky. You put something in front of a photon, it'll stop. It'll get absorbed by it. And photons don't run into each other unless we really work hard at it. Um, but scientifically proven that you can make a photon run into another photon. Um, photonic computing. Well, what's the next one from that? Oh, we'll do we'll do quantum computers. And what they're finding out is, yeah, the actual quantum chip is very small. It's about the size of a postage stamp, but it's got how many qubits on it? 64, 100? Compare that to the thing that has 30 billion transistors on it, and it's half the size of a playing card. It's just no comparison. And then when you add in the, oh, yeah, the quantum computer is um, superconducting. So we have to take the entire thing and put it in a giant cylinder and dump in liquid helium. Big, expensive, runs on a lot of power to keep it cool. You're just never going to get that to take dominance over the 30 billion transistors that runs on your laptop air cooled by a fan. But it's not that it's stopping them because they're now saying that even before they reach the seven nanometer electron tunneling limit, they're running into a problem. All these transistors have a certain degree of efficiency where they want to switch a certain level of current to say one or zero and they can put power in, but what comes out as the one is not as much power as they put in. So some of that electrical power is being absorbed in the transistor and turned into heat infrared. Mm -hmm. When you have 30 billion transistors in that small a space, the amount of heat becomes enormous. And if you've ever seen like rack mounted high end servers these days, it's a giant, you know, half the size of a playing card sized chip. And it's got this cooling tower on top of it that the cooling tower is seven inches tall. And it's got giant fins on it that are so thin they'll cut you if you slice along the edge of them. And they've got copper plumbing pipes with um, heat transfer um, liquids in them to cool all the heat coming off. So they're now thinking, they had an old they had an old supercomputer that was water cooled and it cost a fortune to run. They wanted to give it away to a high school, but <laughs> no high and school. High school said, <laughs> I'll, "I'll just go get a Raspberry Pi for it." Just as could fast. afford to, yeah, could afford to right. maintain that sort of thing. So if you remember back into the history of supercomputing, um, Cray computers had one called Bubbles. Okay. And in order to cool the computer efficiently, rather than using water or alcohol, they used synthetic blood plasma. Oh, no. It was, not, it was not organic. It was synthesized, but it had all of the heat dissipation properties of blood plasma, not blood cells, the, the water-like substance that's in your, in your vessels that conducts heat away. And they found that that works far better than water or even alcohol. Oh, my God. And if it leaked, it would congeal. So if you ever sprung a leak with water, it would destroy your computer. If you sprung a leak with alcohol, it could set the building on fire. But if you sprung a leak with synthetic plasma, yeah, you'd find the leak quickly because the flow would stop. That's yeah. just a point in history of how you went from mainframe supercomputer that occupies a you know, building, all the power and cooling, down to, see my Apple Watch? Yeah. <laughs> And it's it's far faster and has more RAM and more ROM than that yeah. Cray supercomputer. Yeah, I just I just work with technology. I go look. Hey, look look what they're doing there. That's interesting. How's that going? 
Like, what's the latest uh, data from Fermi Labs regarding the muon G2 results? How many sigma is it? And most people will go, what? <laughs> it's not the kind of conversation you can carry out in, uh, let's just say, general public mixed company. Because uh -huh. they won't get it. But luckily, I have an audience that thinks a little different and is tolerant of me when I spew out stuff like that. Everybody awake? <laughs> uh. That's okay. I, I never show any disdain whatsoever for anybody that ever falls asleep with me reading PowerPoint slides. <laughs> oh, it gets late sometimes, yeah. Well, you'll also notice that some of this stuff, I, I couldn't get a lot of pictures for it because some of it is stuff that either doesn't exist or is behind DARPA, you know, black project walls. And I, I just couldn't get, I could get text on it. I could get, you know, I could go on websites and read like the abstract, but if you want the actual paper, oh, that's a hundred plus dollars. Like, no, I'm not going to pay for that. So, but right. you can go on Google patents and find anything that's patented worldwide. Really? Google patents? Yeah. Google patents, plural. Okay. So if you think there's something for which there's a patent, you can go on Google patents and just type in words and it'll go see if there's a patent already defined for it. Uh huh. Okay. So there are actually UFO technologies, quantum drives and things like that, for which there are patents. And the U.S. Navy actually has one person that uh, is no longer in the Navy that they uh, use that person's name for the U.S. Navy patents because patents, strange as it sounds, are by people. When you see, hey, IBM and Apple have lots of patents. No, they don't. They're the company that the person worked for when the person created the patent and the patent has their name on it. And it says, hey, this person works at IBM or this person works at Apple. And when you went to work for those companies, you sign an employment agreement that says anything you cook up for us belongs to us. Well, that kind of that works out, too. Like if you go to Georgia Tech or something and you, you know, cook up something in the lab that belongs to Georgia Tech. <laughs> Well, um, it's theirs. Yeah, yes and no, because I've known people that graduated from universities, and while they were at the university, they worked on projects in robotics or um, flying drones. And when they left, they started a company, and they used that exact same technology to advance drones and robotics. They used the what they learned at the university as the starting point. And then they took a step up, and that way they could say, it's no longer yours, I improved it. Yep. What you can do for patents, you can say, I took the patent for Casimir quantum power modules, and then I improved it by changing the process for creating the power generation cells, or I extrapolated that, yeah, these are really tiny, but if you stack a bunch of them up, you can make a AAA battery out of it. And if you want a lot of them, then make a big pile of batteries and you can have like an FPNL power plant that runs on these things and just keep extending it. And the more you extend it, the more, hey, you too could file a patent. Improved Casimir power generation module. Okay. So we're still recording at this point. Uh, anything to say before I stop recording? The you talked about the satellites earlier in the news when you talked about it, yep. um, and and that they were launched. You know, I I heard about it on the regular news, and and they haven't been talking about every time he goes. You know, they send up the space rocket. You know, the satellites. Mm -hmm. They and I was wondering, was there something different about this one that made it into the news? Because nope. it didn't sound like anything different from what they nope. said. Nope. In fact, the news media has kind of gone slow roll on announcing Starlink or SpaceX launches. Yeah. Because it happens so often. The way I find out when SpaceX has a launch is I go to SpaceX.com and they'll tell you, what satellites they've launched recently and what satellites are coming up. Oh, sorry, what launches are coming up. So just go to SpaceX.com 
and look at their launch schedule. I was just wondering why the media doesn't pick this up a little bit more. Oh, I'm boring. It's boring? Yeah. Starlink launched another batch of satellites. Well, either they go, again? I thought they, uh, how many get, how many they got up there now? 4,000? Well, people don't realize that they age out and improve the technology. They're on now on version 2.0. So a lot of the 1.0 version satellites, they're purposefully steering back down and burning up, but you never hear about those. They just happen and they launch more. So people think every Starlink satellite ever launched is still up there. No, they've retired a lot of them, but they have to launch more to cover the whole planet. And they keep adding on new countries. Like every month they add another small number of countries. And if you think about countries where they can't afford the infrastructure to put in, you know, mobile wireless or fiber optic networking or something like that, um, it's pretty cheap to have a Starlink satellite go overhead and an entire village buys one Starlink receiving station. And now all of a sudden the village can share 150 megabits of internet. Now, who's the competitor to Starlink? Um, this is a funny thing. Um, Starlink from day one said, our satellites are going to orbit low, which means they're only going to have a lifespan of about five years before um, air friction drags them back down. But by being lower, the radio propagation delay from Earth to satellite, satellite back down to Earth, is less than 100 milliseconds, which means you can do things like live video streaming over it and you don't have any delays. Well, there's another company called OneWeb and they wanted to launch their satellites medium elevation orbit. That way they could launch fewer satellites. Each satellite has a bigger radio footprint. The satellites go overhead slower so they can have a smaller constellation network. And SpaceX said, sure, go ahead, knock yourself out. And they used to launch by Russian rockets. And when the embargo happened, they could no longer launch by Russian rockets because they were a UK-based company. So wow. how do they get up there? SpaceX. So oh, wow. OneWeb is paying SpaceX, their competitor with Starlink, to launch the OneWeb satellites. Somebody wanted to write a science fiction um, thriller could they make um, these satellites be like, um, you know, like it, it somehow dominate, being dominant to the world? Like all no. of a sudden this person has all this power. No, because a That's person good. doesn't. SpaceX is a privately owned firm and it's not exclusively owned by Elon Musk. It's owned by oh. a consortium of investment brokerage companies. So... He may be the CEO, uh, but Gwen Shotwell calls the day-to-day actions. That's a woman running one of the largest high-technology companies on the planet, and she's doing a fantastic job. And she can't become an evil... Uh, <laughs> she can't become an evil maniac? Not in still work for Elon, no. <laughs> But uh, she knows it, it she seems, knows exactly what to do and how to do it, and she gets it done. It just seems like uh, it, it it's giving a lot of power to our skies to one company. Well, other companies can create the technology of satellites and rockets and go through all of the, you know, dozens of feet of paperwork per launch. Um, like they do with the FCC and the FAA. And you too can create a worldwide constellation of thousands of satellites because there's nothing actually stopping you. Yeah. So it's what billionaires do with their money. And they're making money on this. Yes. Well, actually, he's making about $100 per user of Starlink per month. And he's got over um, a million users at this point. He only makes a hundred dollars. Yep, that's the monthly month? fee. Well, that seems reasonable. Well, that's one of the reasons why I said, "Yeah, hook me up," because back then my internet bill with uh, 
back then it was AT and T, um, was the better part of a hundred dollars a month just for high speed internet. And I said, I, I want to get off of this, so I signed up for Starlink. And any day now, any day now, any day now, they were going to hook me up. And they're focusing on places on the planet where you cannot easily get internet access. So, not big cities like Fort Lauderdale. So you're still waiting for? No, I I canceled my reservation. I said, you know, when when you finally say we're doing it over the whole planet now, I might come back, but I want the price to be less because now you've got you know a hundred million subscribers. You're taking in a billion dollars a month. Um, no, got to bring that price down. Now, if you said it was twenty dollars a month, but you got to pay five hundred dollars for the equipment up front, I do that because right now I'm looking at upgrading my four G home internet access to five G, and I'm going to be spending roughly six hundred dollars for the receiver and router, and spending probably seventy dollars to get my AT and T account updated, and then it'll be twenty dollars a month, like it is now. So this lovely internet connection I'm talking to you on cost me twenty dollars a month. Now, granted, I only get about twenty megabits down and um, twenty-eight megabits uplink. It's weird because of four G that my uplink speed is actually faster than my downlink speed. But if you ever see one of those pictures where they're talking about the Kessler syndrome and the threat of all the thousands of satellites that are up there. If you see a picture of the Earth, and the Earth is an inch across, and then you see all the satellites, and you can see every one of the satellites, and they're really close together, it's like, that's a fabrication. The Earth is 8,000 miles across. The satellites are separated by 50 miles in one direction and 100 miles in another direction. They can't even see each other. In order for, for Starlink satellites to communicate with one another, over long distance, they use lasers, and they're just direct line of sight communication from one satellite to another. So the the threat of the Kessler syndrome has more to do with countries blowing up satellites and causing debris fields, or satellites exploding because they're not built right, than it has to do with the nasty old Starlink constellation satellites. Well, I think they're taking a um, this uh, you know them shooting. Uh, rockets off frequently yeah. uh, uh, with the satellites. They're taking that and they're advertising for people to come down to Florida to see the the uh, rockets they're having. You know, they, oh, they yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, oh, yeah. The Cape is promoting heavily the fact that you can come down and see a launch. And if it's a SpaceX Starlink launch and you miss it because of bad weather, just wait a day or two. They'll launch it anyway. Yeah. Unlike, you know, a NASA deep space mission or astronauts being on board if you miss your launch window it might be a month before you're going to see the launch again yeah SpaceX is like hey as soon as the weather clears up and the time of day is just right we'll launch it aside from spacex when you launch a rocket generally not reusable throw that one away go build another one from scratch spacex has um falcon 9 rocket launches with first stages that have flown for 15 times. They've got uh, shrouds on the top of satellite compartments that have flown for 11 times. The amount of money they're charging for launches is not to build a new rocket every time, not to build new enclosures every time, not to build new Dragon capsules every time. They're reusing all this stuff. Well, that's smart. It is, because... Nobody else on this planet has ever successfully done that, and they've done over 200 um, successful landings of orbital class rockets. And this year alone, they've done 58 launches. If they dropped the price to $20 a month and they made the equipment $50, would they displace uh, Verizon and T-Mobile and AT&T? Yeah, at that price level, they would, but they can't get down to that price level at this point. Um, the demand would be too high. The demand would be too high for how few satellites they have. Yeah, 4,000 is a few if you count how many are overhead right now. 
about well, maybe maybe I'm totally wrong, but I thought they worked with our in, uh, in, uh, the the grid. Um, their ground stations do connect to the internet. Yes. No. What no, I... the, no. The the internet is a routed infrastructure. As in, if I'm a customer of AT and T, and I have an AT and T four G connection, um, I can literally connect to anything on the internet anywhere on the planet even if that other thing on the planet is connected by a different service provider. So um, much like I can take my mobile phone, which is on AT&T, and I can call somebody who's on T-Mobile or Verizon, and I don't have to care about that. It just works. It's in their best interest to make it work. Same thing with the internet. So if I want to use SpaceX Starlink for my internet access, I could get to any place on the planet, even if they weren't connected by a Starlink. They won't connect me up as a residential subscriber in the city of Fort Lauderdale. But there is a data center 10 minutes away from my house. That data center has four or five Starlink dishes, small dishes, in their back lot. They're connected to Starlink. Now, why would they be connected to Starlink? because their customers are on Starlink and they're on Starlink. So it goes from their customer up to Starlink, over to another Starlink satellite, down to their data center on Starlink. So the total transfer time is less than if they went up to Starlink, over to Starlink, down to Starlink, and then out to Verizon, and then went over a like a T3 line into a data center from Verizon. And the only difference there you're talking about is what is the transit delay time? And is it less than 100 milliseconds or is it 250 milliseconds? Which doesn't sound like a lot because it's a small fraction of a second. But when you're doing financial transactions, every millisecond can mean millions of dollars. So, yeah. Data centers like being on Starlink if their customers are on Starlink because it reduces the transit delay of the data considerably. The method behind the madness is usually always money. Thank you. Okay.